for tricky issues in learning design. Today, I'm joined by my director of learning design, Phil Gon, uh, and myself. And in this episode, we're going to be discussing learning design trends for 2024, because it is the new year, and that seems to be what you do in the new year at the start of January. It's all about trends. And so, Phil, welcome to the podcast. We'll be looking at trends today, by the sounds of it, then. We are looking at trends today, though we need to invite people backstage, really, because when we first talked about this, I was like, oh, no, do we have to do the one about trends? It's like, that's the that's the content that is everywhere. It's the content that, for me personally, I always find very frustrating because as a child, those sorts of conversations meant that Christmas was over, the Christmas tree had to come down, um, all the fun was was done, and now we're talking about the new year. So I, I always treat these moments when the newspapers and LinkedIn and various other places suddenly proliferate with stories about trends and all the stuff that we're meant to be thinking about with a level of some existential exhaustion. So I just want to put that out there. <laughs> uh, so when we get into these trends, let's just uh, ensure that we sort of give them a jolly good shake um, and we don't just fall into sort of lazy journalism. What do you think? No, that's fair enough. I think, yeah, it's, uh, I'm definitely a bit existentially exhausted from Christmas. So uh, let's let's see where <laughs> we end up with the trends. That's calories. <laughs> that's mince pies. That's your children. Uh, it is, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's definitely my children. Um, no, I think it's, it's true. It's the, it is a common thing to start looking at trends for 2024. And there's some interesting ones. I think, you know, it's obviously AI has been a massive trend throughout 2023. And in terms of learning design, AI continues to be a huge topic. Um, but uh, I think increasingly, I'm not going to say people are sick of it, but um, it is the dominant topic. And like any dominant topic, I think it's interesting to think about what other topics might be available to discuss. So as a AI continues to sort of obliterate other other um, topics of discussion, I think we need to sort of dig into that and go and look at what are the other trends around that. But there are some interesting ones coming out through you know research and the papers that come out this time of year around things like you know, personalized learning paths, micro learning, and immersive learning technologies, all that kind of thing. Data driven decision can making. Can I, to... there? can I just can I just stop you there on that one? Because sort of micro learning, just for my benefit. I mean, I think I understand it. I think I sort of have a feeling about it. But micro learning, what's the? Um, because it sounds almost like a bad thing in a way. Micro learning. <laughs> I sort of I, in my time working with students, I've met many students who would love the idea of micro learning um, but I'm, I'm, sure, but I'm not sure I've got the definition right right so what's give us a give us a quick um head to toe on micro learning what is it so micro learning is, is broadly this idea that attention spans are short people in uh, certainly in, in a business environment need to learn quickly and so it's about shrinking learning into very small bite-sized chunks that usually can be distributed quickly through video platforms and apps um to to enable rapid uptake so it makes sense but it, it does very much go against the sort of the, the 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 argument for duration in learning and quality learning and there's there's certainly a place for both um but i mean micro learning has been a you know a big topic for the last sort of five six years in in learning learning development um but it's it's interesting to now look at that in the context of what's happening with ai and sort of generating uh, text very quickly as to what is the purpose of, of micro learning and I think there's an interesting sort of anti trend around long form learning like if if micro learning is great then is, does that mean it's better than long form learning are we saying that micro learning is better I don't know what are your thoughts on that it's just interesting you made a distinction there around micro learning as being something that that, that fits around the needs of business because business we have this idea of a business being something that's too busy to learn um it's got lots of other things it has to do but people need to be brought on and onboarded or trained or you know topped up in terms of their skills and the idea being that if you can do that fast and sort of like snacking it's a bit like I mean, I remember, you know, what in the institution I used to work at, that everybody ate at their desk. Everybody had their lunch at, over their keyboards. And even as people were doing it, there was a sense of tragedy about that because everybody <laughs> understood the sense in taking an hour and having their lunch with other, with another human being as opposed to eating your sandwich, filling your keyboard up with grated cheese and sending just another one of those work emails. So I do understand the whole point about all business micro learning we're too busy to learn so we've got to do it really quick 
what's the research is there any research or anything around the efficacy of micro learning just out of interest the idea of i mean what's your instinct maybe that's a better question around i mean is that how you do it tony do you micro learn do you like do you sort of like medicate sort of pop in a kind of a uh, a quick little bit of um, knowledge on your way to do something else is that is that what you're are you doing more of it like that is that how you're doing it well, that's a great question i think it for me it's a question of what is or when is it appropriate because yeah sure i, I use micro learning when i need to learn something quickly if i need to learn how to do a piece of video editing or or something that i need to learn quickly i'll just youtube it and micro learning is great because in three minutes i can figure out how to do that thing that i couldn't do but there are times when I need a more immersive experience or a, just certainly a longer experience. And certainly if I'm going to have a transformative experience that's going to sort of shift my worldview about something, then that's not going to happen through micro learning. So I think it's it's a good example of where in learning design, you, you do need to think pragmatically and say, well, what is the most appropriate mode for this particular learning outcome if it is just acquire this bit of information very quickly so that this person can do this thing that they couldn't do before then sure if it's a three minute video or a 30 second video then that's great if i want them to fundamentally shift their attitude about how they show up to work or how they approach teaching then micro learning is not going to do that in and of itself as part of a broader program of, of learning then yes maybe but so for me it's a lot about pragmatism about looking at what's the most appropriate mode i think would you would you i mean i worry because i've sort of I, I i turned 49 a few days ago so i am officially i think that makes me middle age and I, i'm not sure if that's late middle age now or that's just middle age but so i'm often aware that some of the words i use i sometimes think are these just a product of my of my slipping towards you know irrelevance um but when i think about sort of micro learning absolutely as you when you say um the expediency of just needing a bit of knowledge, um, needing to sort of like almost a bit like that. It's that Wallace and Gromit image when Gromit is building the railway track just ahead of the train, every, you know, just track by track. And sometimes if I'm sort of like on a job or I've got to fix something, I will micro learn like that. But it does feel very much like Gromit reaching for a bit of railway line. And just it feels a little bit like a tiny bit breathless, a tiny bit sort of like um, hand to mouth. And sometimes I sort of worry that that's disallowing me the time to wonder if about the quality of the learning that I'm undertaking or you know I can't really discern I'm no I'm not a connoisseur I'm just kind of munching you know munching 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 and sometimes I wonder too about kind of like the you know the what tiktokification of duration the idea that you know we know why like the likes of tiktok are driven with that speed and tweets being sort of short it's to sort of produce compulsive interaction with some of these platforms and there's loads of people as we know whose job it is to build um i don't know build systems that produce new behaviors in us that speed us up and it's amazing how fast we can go and we can accelerate but there's uh, i guess the middle-aged part of me the bit that grumbles about wheelie bins and worries about recycling that part of me has a slight question mark over uh, micro learning as being something that's being done unto us in the image, perhaps of software or or, or um, this or the behaviours that perhaps we don't need, but we've got that we've got anyway. Does that make sense? It's like we're being sort of shaped, and it's like, are we doing the shaping or are we being done unto? Um, there we are. There's a there's a question for you. What, what's your view? I'm assuming it shifts around. Yeah, I think so. There was a good question in the chat there from Carl saying, is micro learning a must for the business environment? And and yeah, to sort of extend your metaphor about the grommet building the tracks, I think micro learning enables you to build the tracks and keep building the tracks, but it doesn't enable you to question whether you're building the tracks in the right direction or if you should be going over that way. So to, to respond to Carl to your question, I think it's, it, it yeah, micro learning is useful if you need to upskill people quickly to keep them going in that direction quite quickly. But if you're just using micro learning, then it, it's not enabling people to engage in deeper thinking around should we be doing this or that. So again, it's it's pragmatism. It's it's very suited to a certain type of learning and a certain type of learning outcome. That's yeah, okay. I'm not going to give you if I were to give you all of this information up front, you'd forget it all. So actually, drip feeding it through in a series of short bite sized chunks may well be the most appropriate way for me to get that information to someone so that they can continue to to 
apply it quickly, but that's not going to enable them to, to pull back, see the bigger picture, reflect on it, decide whether or not it's suitable for them or for the business. So I think you absolutely need, you need both or even you need multiple modes of learning. You need a bit of micro learning when you're deploying things, but you also need longer form, more expansive, more in-depth thinking when you need to think about changing direction or planning different strategies or, you know, conceiving of new products. So yeah, it's, it's very important to not just lump everything into, into one particular mode of learning. And I'm reminded a little bit of the, um, is it a proverb or a homily or a truism, which is that, you know, a little bit of knowledge can be a dangerous thing because that, you know, that idea, sometimes you have, you know, I meet friends who um, have have encountered a new idea and suddenly they become quite sort of um, obsessed with it and they sort of extend it, extend it, extend it. And then the sort of the sense or the wisdom underpinning that bit of micro learning is kind of, I don't know, lost in a sense and sort of the idea that, that, that micro dose of knowledge can actually sort of produce distortions and deformations of the wisdom that it was born from. Does that make sense? I see it all the used to see it all the time in, in institutions where you would see perhaps at management level sometimes a new idea come in, often from biz, borrowed from business, often an idea or a word, um, a sort of like a micro dose of sort of business wisdom or something. And then it would suddenly end up in a lot of um, conversations around learning. It would often end up being dispersed and cascaded through. And the original sense of it, a bit like a Chinese whisper, would often be gone. So people would hear something about it, extend that, and suddenly you'd end up in this slightly strange place where everybody was behaving in ways which were quite a long way away, I think, from the original intention of, of, the, of the idea. I don't know if that, you know, that... that <laughs> micro dose where you just think mm, you know and people just seem to want quick fixes it's the same for, it's like a diet pill isn't it or anything else yeah. it's like if it's quick and it's small and it's easily taken people are desperate for those solutions but sometimes i wonder at their long-term benefit you, you might say i think yeah i mean if you wanted to get a bit meta about it you could say that the whole this whole topic of trends in learning design is like micro learning. It's everyone wants a quick fix and say, what well, right, what are the trends? What do I need to be thinking about? Bosh, bosh, bosh. Okay, that's what I need to build into my learning. But actually, so if take for example, personalization. So there's been a lot of talk towards the back end of 2023 around how AI can deliver personalized learning paths, which you know sounds amazing. And actually, that is amazing in terms of being able to personalize learning and learning paths and learning experiences. Wow, why wouldn't we do that? I mean, that's surely that's a no-brainer. And yet it, it potentially sets up this sort of tension between personalization and professionalization. Because actually, if you go into any professional environment, often you don't have control over everything and you can't just do what you want to do. So I don't know, does that make sense in terms of you've got kind of got this tension between what I want and actually what the business needs? Well, again, um I absolutely agree with you in so much as that that tension is something that I sort of encounter. So for example, I've been doing some teaching recently and and again, I'm not, I'm, this is not from a business point of view. This is just from a kind of like a delivery of a, of a curriculum and a creative subject. But I was doing something where the students were being challenged to work with the ideas of somebody else because they had to adapt an idea because professionally the job that the module was kind of based around was this idea that you work with the material of other people so you are not the content author you are um, metabolizing other people's work and executing it in such a way that other people can share it so that was kind of the through line if you like of the module which was like you will work with someone else's text and what I discovered very quickly was that the with some of the students who enjoyed all of that less, the thing they enjoyed uh, the least was working with somebody else's text because it wasn't their cup of tea. It wasn't their thing. It wasn't what they were interested in. It wasn't what they would have chosen themselves. And I had some very delicate conversations around the fact that I think I actually used it at one point. I said that your feelings around the text that are irrelevant um the, the, because the arc is about how you respond to this fixed point and how you work with it and and metabolize it 
professionally for somebody else. And I know that that would have been easier for me if I'd said, you know what, do your own thing. This can be completely personalized. Um, just do it, except that doesn't represent the realistic destination of those skills. You know, that doesn't represent that. So I think there are absolutely um, that thing about personalization and that learners, um, that the perhaps learning designers, have a responsibility to really personalize. I think you could be, without being even too much of a contrarian about this, and hopefully without being too much of kind of like misery guts worrying about his wheelie bins too much, I actually think that there is a whole module which is getting people to experience the moment they don't get to have a personal experience of something. That mm. that I think that that sort of the disappointment or the resentment or how do you metabolize frustration or how do you metabolize boredom professionally speaking if one of your job roles is to not experience the me 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 but to experience the them 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 or the you know the boss 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 and i i hear that a lot i mean we've worked with some clients recently haven't we who are trying to close the, the gap between um undergraduates leaving a particular discipline and moving into the workplace and so much of the subtext of that misalignment is around i think the tension of, of personalization as the as an antagonist of yeah. professionalization that they are actually it's an there's an antagonism between those two ideas so we know that learning design in order to land with people needs to be much better at recognizing people as individuals agreed and with that inclusivity diversity the whole shebang all of that that's an absolute sort of point of wisdom but as you've said, you know, there does seem to be this sticky end or this 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 reality, which is that some of the training around personalization might be de-preparing people for a more professional environment. Um, so so I don't know what you think about what I think about that. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And I think that that it is very much the experience that we've had over the, the last 12 months working with clients around building learning programs. And it's always trying to negotiate that tension between what does the learner want versus what does the learner need versus what does the business need? Um, because, as you say, if you, if you if a learner thinks that it's all about them and if a learning program is set up to provide an experience that's all about the learner, then there is a big risk that you are not preparing the learner effectively for the reality that when they get into a workplace environment, it isn't about them. And yes, they will have some control over what they need to learn. But fundamentally, the business has a strategy, the business has outcomes, the business needs to learn, the business needs people to have a certain set of knowledge and skills to deliver those. And they may be in conflict with what that particular learner wants. So I think this idea of personalization is an interesting trend, because it's not that you can argue it both ways, but you need a bit of both, you need, the learner needs to have some self determination over perhaps how they learn, uh, and a little bit around what they learn, but that needs to be wrapped within a much broader framework as to and what does the business actually need these people to do to, to perform these tasks. So I think negotiating that tension is really interesting. And it's just, I suppose in many ways you could extend that to technology itself. There's, you know, it's it's hard to imagine learning not happening through technology at the moment because everything's designed to be delivered quickly, like we were saying, micro learning through apps, through um uh, just very quickly and rapidly but actually you could look at things like technology detox as a trend like what does anti-technology look like and what's the value of taking people out of a technology mediated environment so that they have a uh, an analog experience and actually when might that be appropriate because there is a real danger that we just assume that technology is essential for all meaningful learning because we've just got used to it like you say it's just it's there all the time Chat GPT speeding things up. But actually, if we want people to, to pull back and stop and think, we may need to take technology out of the picture. Not, not altogether, but perhaps for a period of time, just to remind ourselves what it's like to think without uh, being AI assisted or technology assisted. Again, I just want, and there's a um, question from Carl in the chat, which I think we'll circle back around to, but I just want to say in another sort of, um, as I can always be relied upon to bring in some element of pop culture, um, that I'm reminded of when they rebooted recently 
uh, well, not so recently, they rebooted Battlestar Galactica, right? So bear with me, Tony, right? Bear with me. But um, that was all about sort of AI and um, robots taking over and so on and so forth. And anyway, that whole series ended finally with um, everyone foregoing technology and becoming an artisan culture. I think they all end up on a planet and decide that technology was the death of the human race and so on and so forth. And I think about sort of, um, you know, the detox of, of tech and sort of, you know, and it is possible, isn't it, to start advocating for a kind of an analog unplugged nostalgia, you know, as if there was ever a time really without technology in that sense. But I can totally imagine, um, you know, from a learning design point of view, that I can see a million um, meaningful activities that would be better served by doing the offline. So, you know, if you were doing a, um, I don't know, if you were running a, um, a foundation course, um, I don't know, and you were doing the ceramics course, yes, there they they, they, they could be an amazing one where you 3D print and you work in some, you know, highly sort of um, tech sense. But I can also imagine that if you did that for week one, week two, you take, take students out to the riverbed and they dig the mud um, with their hands and they build a pot from, from riverbed clay and it would be the discussion between those two activities where some really interesting stuff would happen and 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 yet you can imagine meeting the complaint of like why are you getting people to go to a riverbed when manufacturing now for ceramics is x y and z but you'd absolutely have to be able to sort of speak to the value in 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 layering up people's knowledge around a discipline or around a material or whatever it is so there will always be i think um brilliant reasons to unplug and there'll always be brilliant reasons to to plug in at the same time and i just think it comes down to this very simple thing which we've got all these trends in front of us right we've got the trends and the thing about trends and 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 as you said tony about how they kind of represent a kind of a in their own way a kind of speeding up a cognitive acceleration we've got to be thinking about this now we've got to be thinking about this now um the whole point really about trends they're best understood as just an as another element on your tool belt you know on your batman utility belt because all of them are interesting um all of them are relevant but the idea of, of being compelled to make one more important than others or more valuable than others i just think you're always there um putting the sort of the cart before the horse in in that sense because i i mean I, you know, if we look at that list of uh, if we look at a list of trends and there's you could absolutely purposefully design activities that were really well served by all of those things and likewise you could decide that if you wanted to decide that micro learning was the way forward you could disappear down that rabbit hole and you could murder an entire bunch of learning experiences just as easily so you know we that that conversation about what is the skill on top of the skills or what is the insight that sits over the insights it really is the one about um, what are you doing and why what do you want to do and what gap are you trying to close and it's it's that right yeah i, I completely agree i think this is where and you know, we've said learning design is, is pragmatism and i think it's it's easy to underestimate the, the value of that because it really when you need people to learn something whether in a educational setting or a business setting it should absolutely be determined by pragmatism what needs to happen and what is the most appropriate experience to enable people to do that thing to meet that outcome based on who they are where they are how old they are whereabouts in the world they are whether they're online or in person uh, what their cultural background is, what their prior experience is, all, all of those things, once you you put all those factors in and you sort of shake them around in your melting pot and then out of that, using through learning design, should emerge a pragmatic response. And that really is where a learning design, I think, adds massive value because actually it cuts through a lot of these trends. These trends are, yeah. uh, they're not, they say they're not tools necessarily, but they are ways of thinking about how you might achieve that outcome that might be suitable in a certain circumstance or a certain situation, but equally might not be suitable for another circumstance. If you were to just, like you say, lump everything into micro learning or suddenly move everything offline, it's probably not appropriate. It has to be determined by pragmatism. Like, why is that appropriate now at this time in the learning journey? Actually, yeah, three minute video probably is the best thing, but over there, it probably isn't the best thing. So it, it does return 
learning design to this point of pragmatism and the argument that we should be fundamentally designing learning experiences based on a clear assessment of outcomes and learners' needs. And these trends are interesting, but it's, yeah, it's very easy to sort of jump on the bandwagon, I think. Yeah, I mean, I think a trend is, you know, maybe a fat, maybe a fad by any other name in that respect. And I think, and we talk a lot about congas and the idea, I mean, because this idea of behaviours which uh, become very, very sort of um, consensus driven. And there you've got groupthink. And it's so, um, it's important to be a contrarian. Um, as I see, I see being contrarian as a, as another expression of pragmatism, because, you know, when everybody is doing something a particular way, um, it's not, you know, <laughs> pretending that somehow, you know, wow, you know, I'm outside of these things and therefore I'm more cool or more, more sort of above it all. It's just that notion that sometimes, um, giving the contrary view, um, just feels incredibly useful. And I think it's sort of in, in advance of this discussion, I just did a very quick sort of um, audit of myself about, do I really think that micro learning is um, great? Is it exciting? Is it an exciting idea? Am I excited by any of these trends for 2024? And I think excitement's a weird one um, because I look down that list of the trends and they all just feel like things that you, that not only we've done, but we're doing maybe five years ago and yes we you know ai it wasn't there but this this notion of looking for a tool that could get you from um giving time to the wrong stuff to give you giving you time to the right stuff we've always been involved in these things so i'm slightly sort of um i give a side a bit of side eye to these trends because they all seem a little bit like they are designed to make us think a little bit less about why we're doing things and feel more like the thing itself can deliver it and i don't think the thing itself can deliver it it will be the context for the thing that will deliver it it's like why are you doing any of this stuff um and are you doing it to be current are you doing it to present as um 21st century or something when actually i mean most learners all learners crave and want an authentic experience and i think that's best served by ensuring that the thing you're doing is the right thing f for the right time as opposed to a, a gimmick or a or a gloss or, or or i don't know or just sort of like a conga basically so um so yeah i think to be contrary isn't being annoying i think it's to be very practical in terms of learning design yeah, and I think it's important to, to not be blown off course by trends. I think it would be very easy to look at those trends and go, oh, I should be doing that. Yeah. And, and, and to almost convince yourself that that is the right thing to do. And actually, if you look at things like, you know, we're talking about the slow learning movement and this idea of just, just slowing down and looking as objectively as possible at what is happening in your particular situation, whether that's a course or a module or a business or a team what is actually happening and what needs to happen for that team to move forward or for that course to evolve and it, there's such a danger of of being railroaded by trends and going well it needs to be this whereas actually if you were to take stock of the specific circumstances that you're working within and the specific challenges that you're facing you might find that running in the other direction is the best idea i mean there's i think is it was it the harvard business guys at clayton christensen and one of them said you know, I, I look at the direction that everyone else is going and I walk, I go in the other direction because actually that's often <laughs> where the interesting stuff happens. So I think there is a danger that, that uh, with trends that they they close down thinking rather than opening up thinking and they prevent people from actually seeing what they need in their specific circumstances. So, yeah, they're useful in terms of giving us ideas about what other people are doing, but it's important that they don't stop us from thinking and reflecting specifically on, on our own needs and our own circumstances, I think so. I think yeah. yeah so just you know, I would just conclude that I think that that idea of um, it comes that it's an issue of confidence because I think you need to be able to evaluate the merits and the usefulness of all of this advice and i think that often we know don't we that advice is an exhausting space and i think places like linkedin where this is happening is an exhausting space because it's exhaustingly um designed to produce engagement 
through people producing lists and people trying to just sort of get above a subject and sort of, you know, so you have to be conscious that advice, um, and this, this is a learning design thing, that, that advice, advice itself, it can often be in the image of the person giving it as opposed to the image of the people receiving it. And I, we have to be conscious of that as well. Um, it's a bit like, what's it, what, is this truly useful to me? And is this really sort of, because if you're not very confident, you, as you say, Tony, you can be blown off course and decide to reroute and unplug and um, rip up everything that, that you've been doing because it's not what other people are doing or indeed because it's not very contemporary. And yet, with, but, but we know that things like sort of um, micro learning, micro learning has likely been going on forever. Um, because the ability to ask a person in a corridor a quick question and get an answer, I, well, that seems to me a definition of micro-learning to me. It's that you don't always need a lecture or a two-hour webinar to go to, to, to come away with something useful. So micro-learning is as old as the hills, right, um, on, on one level. So it's just it just has a name that we're going to hear a lot about, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Well, there we go. That's our... That's a good half an hour romp through the the trends of 2024, the anti trends and the danger of being blown off course by trends. So, thank you, Phil. That was a, a good way to kick off the new year. And we'll be here every Friday at one o'clock GMT, thirteen hundred GMT, um, looking at different aspects of learning design. So, if you are listening to this on the podcast, then please do join us. Uh, and if you'd like to pre-submit questions for us to to chat through, then you can get in touch with us on our website at ding global. Just use our contact form. And send us your questions and we'd be very happy to feed those into the discussion so phil thanks very much happy new year and you uh, too. i'm just off to write a big list and put it on linkedin all right so <laughs> I'm, gonna sort of, I'm just off to influence okay <laughs> um, great talking to you tony um yeah brilliant and a happy new year to you and yours indeed exactly yes may, uh, may it may be full of lists of pragmatism <laughs> <laughs> take care